let me introduce the first team. Yender Li, a molecular and cell biologist from, from Ben Ebert Lab, has recently defended his PhD thesis. Before joining the team in Boston, he graduated from National Taiwan University with a dual degree in medicine and physics. Michelle Ma is a structural biologist in Eric Fisher Lab. Born in Hong Kong, she obtained her bachelor degree in molecular and cell biology from the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, Muhammad uh, Murtaza Hassan, a chemical biologist in Nathaniel's Grace, Grace Lab at Stanford, born in Pakistan and raised in, in Canada. He completed his doctoral studies uh, in the Gunning uh, Lab, where he developed potent and selective HDAC8 inhibitors. The first sem seminar is entitled Template Assisted Covalent Modification of DCAF 16 Underlies Activity of BRD4 Molecular Glue Degraders. Okay, cool. Um, yes, um, thanks, Mikolai, for the nice introduction. And thanks, the organizers, for having us at the TBD webinar today. So we are going to present a project about the discovery of a new molecular glue mechanism, which we named it a uh, template-assisted covalent modification. And this is a collaborative project between the Ben Ebert lab, uh, Eric Fisher's lab, and Nathaniel Brace lab. So this project is co-led by three scientists from very different but complementary backgrounds. My name is Yander, and as Mikolai uh, already introduced, I'm a fifth-year Harvard PhD student in Ben Ebert's group, mainly working on the functional genomic screens and cellular validation parts of this project. And Michelle is also a fifth-year Harvard PhD student working in the Fisher Lab. She's driving the chemistry and structural biology effort of this project. And Murtaza is a postdoc researcher in Nathaniel Grace Group at Stanford, and he's leading the development of covalent molecular glue degraders and the chemical SAR part of this project. So to be begin with, uh, this project was inspired by a monomeric VRD4 degrader, GNE11, reported by Genentech in 2019. And they show that if you substitute the chloride moiety of um, BRD4, GK, degrade, uh, BRD4 inhibitor JQ1 to a propargyl amine, the new compound GNE11 becomes a BRD4 degrader. However, the mechanism of action of how this happened remains unclear. And to better understand the mechanism of action of GNE11, we first thought to uh, characterize its minimal diagram. And since GNE11 has this formal domain by the moiety, we hypothesize that either the BD1 or the BD2 domain of BRD4 serve as the diagram for GNE11. And um, to test this, uh, we develop a fluorescent reporter in which um, BD1 or BD2 of BRD4 is fused with EGFP and co-expressed with mCherry. So the ratio of EGFP and mCherry can be measured as a proxy for uh, BD protein stability. And um, using this ASA, uh, we found that GNE11 only degrades BD2, but not the BD1 domain of BRD4, indicating that BD2 is the primary diagram for um, this drug-induced degradation system. And next, uh, we initiate the first round of SAR campaign to see if we can improve the potency of uh, GNE11. Through synthesis of series of GNE structural analogs, uh, we discover an acrylic analog, TMX1, and that exhibit a more potent degradation of BD2 in the report ASA. And uh, we also observe a more potent degradation of endogenous BRD4 uh, using the uh, Western blot ASA. And uh, to confirm the selectivity, we perform a wholesale proteomics with uh, cells treated with TMX1. And as you can see here, BRD4 is the top hit being degraded. And the other bad family protein, BRD2, BRD3, are also among the uh, top degraded hits. Next, um, to identify the molecular machinery required for TMX1 and GNE11 mediated uh, BRD4 degradation, we perform a CRISPR Cas9 reporter degradation screen. So in this screen, uh, cells expressing Cas9 and the uh, BRD4 BD2 reporter were transduced with a guide RNA library that um, target genes in the ubiquitin proteasome system. And nine days after the guide RNA infection, uh, we treat the cells with uh, either degrader or DMSO, and then sort it for cell with increase or decrease level of GFP versus mCherry ratio. 
And um, our screen showed that uh, TMXY induced uh, reporter degradation required decaf 16 as well as the other protein in the decaf 16 ligase complex, such as DDP1, RBX1, and CO4A. And uh, to validate the screen result, we made the K562 cell with complete genetic knockout of DCAP16. We observed that knockout, knockout cell line prevents TMX1 and GN11 induced BRD4 degradation, confirming our poor screen results. Uh, to further corroborate the genetic screen data, uh, we performed an orthogonal IP mass back screen. So in this screen, uh, we used BD2 flag as bait to pull down protein that showed enriched binding to BD2 upon a TMX1 treatment. And consistent with the genetic data, DCAP16 and DDP1 are the top hits showed uh, a specific TMX1 dependent interaction with BD2. And using CoIP, we confirmed the IP mass result and showed that TMX1 and GNE11 can lead to a drug-specific BRD4 uh, DCAP16 interaction in cell. So to further characterize this drug-induced interaction, we uh, sought to reconstitute BRD4 DCAP16 interaction in a fully recombinant system. So we developed this uh, tr free assay which uh, BRD4, BD1, or BD2 is tagged with biotin and conjugated with terbium. And uh, DCAP16, DDB1 is tagged with spy and conjugated to BODP. If there is a drug, a direct drug-induced interaction, we should observe a dose-dependent TRFS signal. And consistent with the cell data, we observe a tighter TMX1-induced interaction between DCAP16 and BD2 compared to BD1. We repeat the tr experiment with GN11 and observe a similar trend, but found that uh, DCAF16 BRD4 interaction was much weaker compared with TMX1. This is consistent with the lower potency of GN11 as a, uh, a BRD4 degrader. And these findings suggest that TMX1 and GN11 function as a molecular glue to recruit DCAF16 to BRD4 BD2, causing the degradation of um, BRD4. And in TRFRED experiment, we also observed an obvious hook if that the interaction of DCAP16 and BD2 decreases when the concentration of TMX1 exceeded uh, 5 micromolar. So hook effect has not been observed with canonical molecular clues, such as suggesting that uh, TMX1 and GNE11 might use an alternative mechanism that distinguishes them from the uh, traditional molecular glue degraders. Thank you, Yander. Uh, so as Yander mentioned, it was very strange that we were seeing a hook effect because hook effect is usually characteristic of bivalent protact degraders or bivalent molecules in general. And so, in so, so a hook effect generally occurs when you have a bivalent molecule that has two separate ligands. Each ligand is capable of binding its own protein of interest. So for instance, if you take an E3 ligase binder and another protein of interest binder that you're interested in degrading, what happens is as you take that bivalent molecule, and you increase the dosage, you reach a concentration at which you have optimal ternary, uh, ternary uh, complex formation. After exceeding that concentration, each ligand of the bivalent molecule is individually able to bind their own respective protein targets, which can essentially compete out the bivalent uh, ternary complex, uh, complex formation. And so what happens is usually molecular glues are unable to bind these two different proteins individually. And so you don't see a hook effect with these uh, monovalent molecular glues. So it was very interesting that we were uh, starting to see a hook effect in our tr fret assays and our degradation assays with TMX1, for instance. And so this led us to believe that it's pos possible that our uh, covalent, uh, our glues were uh, undergoing a different uh, mechanism. And we were thinking that this might be driven by a covalent mechanism because if you look at TMX, it has this, uh, Michael acceptor moiety that we're calling an acrolein moiety that might be thought might be capable of forming a covalent adduct with decaf 16. And so covalent adduct formation of decaf 16 would explain the hook effect since after saturation of decaf 16 covalent adduct formation, additional increases in glue concentration would essentially compete out the ternary complex formed by decaf 16 covalent glue adduct since additional glue molecules would individually bind to BRD4 and thereby compete out the DCAF16 and the BRD4 ternary complex formation. So with that, we wanted to, we wanted to interrogate 
the covalency of these molecules. And so we did a, a, a series of intact mass labeling experiments with the glues in the presence of uh, BD2 and without BD2 and DCAF16. So first when we looked at TMX1, we looked at DCAF16 incubated with the glue itself, and we saw a marginal uh, increase in the covalent adduct formation. But when you incubate a DCAF16 glue in the presence of BD2, you see a remarked increase in the DCAF16 covalent adduct formation. And so this was in line with the hypothesis that we were starting to develop now, that what's actually essentially happens is that the covalent glue binds to BD2, it generates a template that is complementary to DCAF16, and then the BD2 delivers a covalent warhead to DCAF16. So likewise, if you look at GNE, since GNE has an alkyne uh, moiety, we know from literature that alkynes are essentially uh, non-reactive, but there are some small instances where they can act uh, via covalent mechanism. And so if you look in the presence of BD2, DCAF16 showed a slight inc increase in the covalent adduct formation by GNE. And that in contrast with the bivalent DCAF16 recruiter KB02 that was published in 2019 in Nature Chemical Biology by, uh, by Benjamin Cravat, uh, if you look at uh, uh, KB02, which contains a, a chloroacetamide, whether you have BD2 present or not, you essentially see the same amount of covalent adduct formation by KB02 of DCAF16. So this was then in conjunction with our hypothesis that BD2 first, or the covalent glues first bind BD2, and without the presence of BD2, they're essentially unable to bind DCAF16. And after the covalent glues bind BD2, this, you, the complementary protein surface of BRD4 then generates a template for DCAF16 to bind. BD2 then delivers a covalent warhead to uh, DCAF16, which leads to the covalent adduct formation of the covalent glue and DCAF16, which subsequently leads to ubiquitination of BRD4 and its degradation of BRD4. So after you saturate the covalent adduct formation of DCAF16 by these covalent glues, addition of more glue molecules would essentially compete away BRD4 to, uh, and prevent the ternary complex formation of BRD4 and DCAF16, leading to what we saw as the hook effect. And so with that then, we were starting to become more sure that this is happening via a covalent driven mechanism. So if you look at panel A, uh, you have TMX1. We looked at the covalent warhead of TMX1 and we did a small SAR uh, where we switched out different covalent warheads to see whether we can optimize for DCAF16 recruitment and uh, BRD4 degradation. So we made a series of molecules, two of which we chose as the model substrates to model analogs to, to test. Uh, and so MMH1 and MMH2, uh, they, so MMH1 contains the, the uh, acrylamide and MMH2 essentially contains uh, an analogous molecule, which is slightly more reactive than MMH1. And you can see that as you tune the warhead, you can see a remarked increase in the uh, BD2 degradation, where essentially at one nanomolar by MMH1, you see 80% degradation of BD2. So this then led to uh, this, these two molecules that showed uh, robust degradation, nanomolar degradation of BRD4 and had the lowest molecular weight in literature of any BD, uh, BRD4 degrader that we had known. And if you look at panel C then, you can see that as you change the warhead from GNE to TMX to MMH compounds, you see an increase in the ternary complex uh, uh, formation as shown by the TR fret signal. This then prompted us to look at degradation potency and uh, its uh, potential for covalency in cells. So if you look at MMH1 and MMH2, degradation of BRD4 in cells is essentially equipotent to bivalent uh, degraders, DBET6 and MZ1, that are well known in literature to be BRD4 degraders. And they, sh they show pretty robust degradation of BRD4. If you look at washout experiments, so what you would expect from reversible compounds, reversible degraders, is that after washout of these degraders in cells, you see rescue of BRD4 degradation. 
And that makes sense because the binding of BRD4 uh, 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 and the the covalent, uh, sorry, uh, binding of BRD4 and the ethyl ligase for reversible compounds, the, the interaction is reversible. So as you wash out the degraders, you essentially have no more degrader left in, in cells. So there's no nothing left to uh, for uh, degradation to happen. Whereas with covalent compounds, once you've la covalently labeled decaf 16, additional washout experiments will not remove the covalent adduct. And so this is why you see a sustained degradation even after washout by MMH1 and MMH2. And this further validated and corroborated our hypothesis that these glues were functioning via a covalent adduct formation in cells as well. And so to, to validate whether this whether covalency was required for degradation by BRD, uh, by DCAF-16, we made non-reactive controls of the acrylamide and the vinyl sulfonamide. So essentially, we took the Michael acceptor apart. We took this uh, acrylamide, the double bond of this acrylamide and the double bond of the vinyl sulfonamide, and we saturated it to remove the reactive species. And you in the TR-FET signal uh, panel B, you essentially see that these non-reactive controls are completely unable to recruit DCAF-16 to BD2. And in panel C, likewise, you see that their degradation is completely rescued once you make the non-reactive controls compared to the reactive MMH1 and MMH2 covalent analogs. Over to Michelle. So next, we wanted to fully understand how BD2 facilitates this covalent um, modification on DCAP-16. And one technique we have on our hands is to structurally characterize the Turner complex using cryo-EM. And at this point, we were able to take advantage of our extensive SAR data, and we chose to work with our most potent compound, MMH2, because it would increase our um, chances of seeing just more numbers of particles that contain the full Turing complex. So we did several rounds of optimization and data collection before finding a condition that gave us a structure at 2.2 angstroms. So here in this movie, I am showing the density of the Turner complex. And to orient ourselves, at the top, we have DDB1 with its two beta propellers um, colored in um, blue, red and gold. And the middle density um, corresponds to DCAP-16, which is broken up in three different regions. And finally, at the bottom, the magenta region core um, is BRD4 um, bromine domain 2. And we can see that there are extensive interactions between DCAP-16 to both DDB1 and also the BD2 regions. I'll show it up close um, later on, but we also see density that is correlating to where our covalent MMH2 compound is located at the interface of DCAP-16 and BD2. So overall, all this supports our model in which DCAV16 and BD2 have this pre-existing structural complementarity as our compounds bind to BD2, then leading to the um, thus leading to the recruitment of DCAV16. And taking a closer look at um, DCAV16 by itself, this protein folds into a structure that is without any homologies across PDB or alpha fold databases. And unlike most other DCAV um, proteins, DCAV16 does not contain a canonical WD40 propeller, um, and it uses um, this helix loop helix um, motif um, that's colored at cyan located at the top to really anchor itself into the DDB1 part. And the rest of um, DCAV16, the NNC terminated regions, fold into this four helix bundle that is then stabilized by a zinc atom. And this is what forms the primary interface with BD2. And the total interface area of DCAV16 and BD2 is around 560 angstroms. And at the interface of DCAV16 and BD2, like I said before, we do observe this density that um, represents MMH2. And most of that compound also overlaps with the JQ1 binding site on BD2. And in line with a covalent mechanism, there is continuous density observed between MMH2 and the cysteine 58 on um, DCAV16 with all the right geometry and distances for a covalent bond. And next, orthogonally, uh, we use alanine scan to look for critical amino acids in DCAV16 that is required for drug-mediated um, interactions with BD2. And so we performed a systematic alanine scan on all residues um, of DCAV16 in our BRD4 repertory cell line. And we specifically look for DCAV16 variant hits that did not lead to BRD4 degradation anymore. And so um, alanine on 53, um, cysteine 177, and also cysteine 179, those scored at top hits in those screens performed with TMX1. And also when we performed the same screen with the DCAV16-based protac, KB02, JK1, as you can see in panels B and C. 
However, um, there was only one cysteine residue, cysteine 58, that was required exclusively for the activity of our molecular glue degraders, but not for KB0 to JK1. And you can see this best represented in panel BD, where we compare um, TMX versus um, KB0 to JK1. And what this tells us is that if you map these residues back onto the structure, Already, I showed you that the compound is covalently labeling cysteine 58, which explains why that particular residue only scores in TMX1 screens, but not um, KB0 to JK1. However, cysteines um, 177 and 179, they're the ones responsible for coordinating this zinc ion in DCAP16. So it makes sense that when you mutate those residues to alanine, you're perturbing the overall um, structural integrity of the entire DCAP16 protein. And similarly, alanine 53, it's pointing towards a um, hydrophobic core of DCAP16. So if you swap it for an arginine, the structure just doesn't tolerate a bulky residue um, in that position. And so therefore, um, our structure and unbiased mutagenesis screens explain why these residues are generally, these three residues are generally important in DCAP16 structural integrity, but cysteine 58 alone is required for activity of our molecular glue degraders because that is where our compound is binding. And so next, we validated these mutants in cells and also in recombinant assays. And we confirmed the cysteine 58 selective effect on both binding and degradation using our degradation assays and co-IPs. And you can see that when um, cysteine 58 is mutated, you no longer get degradation of BRD4 or binding with BD2 in panels A and B respectively. We also purified um, recombinant um, DCAP16 protein with the cysteine 58 mutated to serine, and we repeated the same um, binding experiment in TRFRET in panel C. Um, and you can see that when you um, eliminate cysteine 58, you completely abrogate ternary complex um, formation. And finally, in panel D, um, intact mass spec results that were done with the um, DCAP16 um, C58S mutant completely eliminated um, the DCAP16 TMX adduct formation showing that this cysteine is in fact a responsible residue for where the drug is covalent labeling. And so to summarize um, the main finding of our study, what we discovered is that covalently tagging JQ1 resulted in a new class of BRD4 molecular glue degraders that first bind to BRD4 in its BD2 domain, and then the pre-existing structural complementarity between BD2 and DCAP16 helps the compound get oriented more optimally towards DCAP16 and then allowing it to get covalent labeling it on cysteine 58. The covalency of this compound helps to stabilize the ternary structure that is the um, um, complex that is then formed, which leads to you know, subsequent ubiquination and degradation of BRD4. And finally, because of the covalent nature of our compound, um, this, um, this stays on DCAP16 even after BRD4 is degraded. And so this, uh, and so this translabeling covalent mechanism now may allow us to rethink about uh, how we perceive covalent pharmacology. So for instance, if you look at traditional uh, tra traditional covalent molecules in literature, they show this thing called the cis labeling covalent mechanism, when, when ligands recognize an, a lipophilic oily pocket that's often enzymatic. And then there's this reversible component of binding where the ligand has reversible interaction, enthalpic interactions with uh, pockets. And then you have covalent labeling of that ligand to the same protein that they bind. So essentially a ligand binds protein A and it labels protein A. With our molecules now, we showed that JQ1 uh, tagged, co uh, covalent tagged molecules can bind BRD4, so essentially protein A, but labeling a, a, a protein interactor uh, such as DCAP16. And so this translabeling covalent pharm pharmacology now can potentially expand the scope of what we can actually drug to beyond just drugging molecules that have these well-defined lipophilic pockets. And so this is where essentially uh, we can hypothetically in, in the future, if this is generalizable, we can make these molecules that can bind a druggable protein but then label an, an, an alternative protein that might be druggable or undruggable by covalent, uh, by traditional pharmacology. And then you can imagine this can be leveraged to, to exploit unique pharmacology, uh, such as in this case, for instance, degradation. But beyond that, even such as inhibition, degradation, phosphorylation, acetylation, et cetera. So uh, in summary, 
we've shown that uh, we discovered a novel a novel mechanism where in GNU11, TMX1, MH1, and MH2 uh, de uh, degrade BRD4 via a template-assisted covalent mechanism where they first bind BD2, and then BD2 becomes a, a structural scaffold that once, uh, once it's bound by the covalent molecular glues, it, it orients the warhead to 1658 of DCAF16 that leads to covalent adduct formation which also explains the hook effect that we see in, in, uh, in this study. And what we further show is that this template reactivity is a novel mechanism that we discovered from molecular glues, and it might have uh, many implications for the targeted protein degradation space. And it can also be used to increase the affinity of pre-existing complementary protein interfaces. And so in terms of this particular study, we took JQ1 with covalent tags, and we showed that you can have this translabeling covalent mechanism. And uh, this led to the development of the most uh, lowest, the lowest molecular weight BRD4 degraders in literature that we know of. And potentially, the in terms of future outlook, this electrophile tagging strategy where we attach uh, lipo, where we attach covalent warheads to solvent exposed sites of ligands that have uh, existing uh, proteins that they bind to might become a generalizable, generalizable strategy to have translabeling of uh, potentially undruggable molecules. Um, with that, we would like to thank the three advisors, Ben, Eric, and Nathaniel for supervising and guiding us on the project. And we will also like to give special thanks to the people who made significant contributions to the data provided in this presentation. So in the Eber group, uh, Brittany and Sean helped with many cell validation experiments. And in the Fisher group, uh, Morris offered extensively technical support on the crowd um structural analysis. And Kadar made numerous optimization efforts on TR-FRED, intact mass spec, and crowd em Catherine and Ryan um, performed all the proteome experiments showcased in this presentation. And in the gray lab, Mingxing initiated the first round of the SAR, SAR exploration and developed TMX1, which become one of the primary compounds of this study. And we are also grateful for the outstanding support we received from Scott at the DFCI Blaze Center for intact mass spec experiments and Michelle from the C-Lab for alpha screen assays. Thank you for all for your attention today, and we're happy to take uh, any questions.